Many of you are already familiar with some basic principles of calculus, which really just boil down to limits, derivatives, and integrals. And by themselves, they're, they're very interesting topics that are simple and fun when explained properly. However, what I'd wager that most first and second year calculus students aren't told is that you can actually have fractional derivatives. So, the notation for a standard derivative, if we're given f of x, is of course f prime of x being equal to, usually we write d over dx of the function. And if we continue this in order to find a more generalized kind of way of thinking about the derivative, we can we can continue it for the second, third, or fourth derivatives, etc. And in that case we have well we say it's it's f double prime of x or d over dx and it's kind of we, 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 almost as though we're treating the operator as a variable, which normally you shouldn't do, but but it, it's almost as though it's d squared over dx squared of I mean, that same f function. triple prime of x e equal to the third derivative, and we can do this as as much as we want, really. All we're really saying is that the nth derivative of x. or nth, nth derivative of the function with respect to x. We can say like d to the n over dx to the n of f of x. But this of course kind of begs the question in and of itself, uh, can this, this statement, be generalized further? Can n be, for example, a fraction? Or even you might dare to think n could be a, a complex number. Could we, for instance, take the half derivative or the ith derivative? These are the kinds of wonderful questions that mathematicians ponder themselves. And the answer to those questions are indeed yes. Mathematics, as usual, becomes very elegant when we try to solve these naturally interesting questions. And there is, almost always, not always, but most of the time, a way to, to solve these questions for ourselves. So to be more specific, if we start with, say, a basic power function, a function of x equal to, let's just keep it as x to the k, for instance, and we can assume for now that k is just some integer. So let us attempt to generalize the various derivatives of this function. So we know that the first derivative is equal to k times x to the k minus 1. That is provable using the formal definition of the derivative. And I'm sure you'll, you'll be able to find proof and exploration, uh, ex excuse me, explanation of this in various places. But to continue this, the second derivative would then be, well, we can take the coefficient out and then bring down the exponent, which is now k minus 1. This, you know, bring down this exponent and then say x to the k minus 2 is the new, x the new exponent of x. And we can simply continue this. Uh, so the third derivative, f triple prime of x, we can say uh, it's equal to k times k minus 1, just these uh, coefficients which are just left over, times k minus 2 in this case, because we're again bringing down the derivative, uh, excuse me, bringing down the exponent to get the next derivative, of, and it's times x to the k minus 3. So we can see, kind of just by uh, being able to tell the pattern here, where we're seeing k being multiplied by 
the kind of the, the successive integers that are less than k. And so it, it decreases simply by 1. So it's, it's k times k minus 1 times k minus 2 times, you know, then it would be k minus 3, etc. And just that idea, the, the kind of function that is reminiscent of that principle is really the factorial function. As factorial, with the factorial function, we're taking a number and multiplying every integer less than that number all the way down to one. So essentially, we can we can write that the nth derivative of x is equal to, and we can actually start with k factorial in the in the generalized formula here, at least for this kind of function for this, you know, x to the k. It's kind of a, a simplified, a simple problem to begin with. But that's not completely true, because in, in these instances, like, th there's only one coefficient here, it's, it's k. And that's because it's the first derivative. The second derivative, we have a k times k minus 1. So we're only including some of those values in this product that we're forming. So therefore, the, the way to account for that is actually to divide k factorial by k minus n quantity factorial. Because if you think about it, we're, we're taking the entire product of k factorial, all those integers from 1 to k, but we're only including some of them. The ones that we're not including are the ones in the denominator, because we want them to cancel out. And those are the ones from 1 to the quantity k minus 1, or k, k minus n, for some nth derivative. And then all that would be left are the terms that we want, the, the k times k minus 1. Then we have x, and we have the power, we're seeing k, k minus 1, k minus 2, k minus 3. Those are the just just, you know, across, I guess, four different trials. The exponent of x is what we're seeing here. And it's really simply being decremented that number of times. It's, in fact, being decremented uh, n times for an nth derivative. So really, we can think about it as x to the k, whatever it started as, and then it's k minus n. It's as simple as that. Now, mathematicians, such as I, very often want to generalize certain formulas and certain statements to make them true not for just integer cases, but for other cases, to make them more accurate. So the way to do, to do that for, you know, in this example, would be actually to refrain from using the factorial function, but to generalize it and make it actually the gamma function. So this is a very interesting derivation now. And so we can see some example of, uh, examples of this in the following sections. So the gamma function is really quite interesting. And while well, I'd have some trouble explaining it myself, I will link to some very well done videos here and in the description. So, so please see those, though. it's very worthwhile. Wikipedia has some very interesting, well-written documents as well, uh, so please see the example they give. But for the sake of being original, let's try, for example, the function f of x equals x squared. And suppose we wanted to take the half derivative of this function, and I'm, I'm just going to define g of x to be what that half derivative is. And so it's basically, I'm, I'm going to write it, uh, g to the one half over dx to the one half. This just representing half derivative of x squared. And using our formula, 
which we've devised for basically any, um, essentially any polynomial. It's basically any, um, uh, x to some power. And so in this case, we're, we're basically given the fact that, uh, k equals 2, since the, um, the exponent here is actually 2. And furthermore, we know that the a in this case is 1 half, because we're taking the half derivative. And so with those substitutions, we would get something like... Something like this. And then, more simplified, it would be 2 over the gamma of 5 halves times x to 3 halves. And this is interesting, because we have... In, the, in that denominator, that's interesting, gamma of 5 halves. It, now, the gamma function, as I said before, it's, it's going to become very important. And what you're seeing is basically the Wikipedia page for particular values of the gamma function. So, it gives many uh, many important and, and interesting formulas for, like, half integers. So, in this case, 5 halves, that's, um, that's one of those relevant kinds of... Um, values where we can actually compute a pretty good, um, you know, pretty well-defined solution. And it turns out, as you can see, that the, the gamma function at 5 halves turns out to be equal to 3 fourths times the root of pi. So now that's very fascinating, uh, and we'll, we'll see, we'll see time and again that, um, the square root of pi is, is very well linked to the gamma function, and we see it recurring in, in many multiple instances, really. But, um, since we know gamma 5 halves is equal to 3 square root of pi over 4, then we can make that substitution, basically. And so we just know it's, it's 2 over the quantity 3 fourths root pi times x to the 3 halves. And after that, we can simplify that fraction and basically we get 8 over 3, and if you think about it, what what x to the 3 halves is, is really the square root of x cubed, because we can basically take out this uh, denominator here. It's, it's like if we have x to the 3 over n, if that's our exponent, we basically take out the denominator and we can say it's the nth root of x cubed. Well, in this case, n is 2, so it's the square root of x cubed. I just wanted to clarify that. And we also have, we're dividing by root pi. So we can just simplify this, hopefully that's that's clear enough, that we're getting x cubed over pi. And we can we can just simplify it in that sense. And it turns out that is indeed the um the half derivative of x squared with respect to x. Now isn't that awesome? I'm sorry, but I have to say that is just truly amazing. And I have a few other examples to show you, but isn't this amazing how we get a root pi in there? Now, I, I don't know the full explanation on that yet, okay? I, um, I expect to make some further videos that expand on that, and, um, yeah, that, that's why this is only part one. <laughs> but really, hopefully, hopefully I've, I've gotten your interest so far, and we can, we can expand this. I'm not finished. Basically, if we move on and let's say, well, let us consider what would be like the, I don't know. You know what, how about we take the the uh, quarter derivative, or the, the one-fourth derivative of x squared. Let's try that one, okay? Now look, this is this is getting really interesting. So, um, d to the one-fourth over dx to the one-fourth. Honestly, I'm of the opinion that it doesn't matter too much what we call things in mathematics if, if it's just a matter of notation. Um, it's really the the idea, or the, the theory, or the theorem that actually matters. And mathematics, that's that's my opinion. Uh, very nice quote of uh, my favorite mathematician, C.F. Gauss, is, What we need are notions, not notations. Now, of course, that was probably translated from German or whatever, but... Still, I think he was absolutely right. Anyways, moving on, we're taking the quarter derivative of x squared. And in this case, using, you know, the similar formula as above, we end up getting 2 factorial over the gamma function at, and we're getting 2 minus a quarter plus 1. I suppose I'll write that out. 2 minus a quarter plus 1 
times x to the 2 minus a quarter, because it's, it's 2, it's the same exponent, minus a quarter, which in this case is really just 1 and 3 quarters, isn't it? So I think I'll write that, I just I might as well write that as an improper fraction, 7 fourths, which sounds a little messy when you say it, like the, the exponent is 7 fourths, eh, but well, <laughs> it's okay, it turns out it's okay, we'll, um, we'll work with that when we get to it, but 2 over, we end up getting the gamma function at 11 fourths, Right? Because uh, 2 minus a fourth, that's basically, it's, it's 1 and 3 quarters, which is 7 fourths. And then we add another 4 fourths to it, so it's 11 fourths. And, can you see this? Dang it, no you can't. And what we're getting is, it's gamma of 11 fourths on the bottom. Because basically say 2 minus a quarter, well that's 1 and 3 quarters, which is also 7 quarters, by the way. And we, when we have 7 fourths plus 4 fourths, well that's 11 fourths. But... That's just arithmetic, so no one cares about it. x to the 7 fourths is our same variable, which we're carrying over. But now I have a, uh, a very interesting question to pose to you here. What if we have, you know, wh wh what exactly does this equal? What exactly is gamma of 11 fourths? Well, this is where uh, things get even further interesting. What I'm going to use is something called Euler's Reflection Formula. You can You can look it up. It's... It's a very interesting thing. We're actually about to at least attempt to figure out what the gamma function at 11 fourths is, and, and you'll see how I at least tried to accomplish that. What we're given with Euler's reflection formula has a wonderful sounding name, and indeed is quite, uh, quite fitting for this wonderful formula. We have the gamma function at z, and we multiply it by gamma at 1 minus z, then it will be equal to, get this, pi over sine of pi z. Assuming, of course, that uh, we're taking the sine of radians, basically. We're using radians. But it's interesting. It's, it's uh, truly very interesting that we're, we're given this formula. It's proved by Euler. So now, in this case, I, I just thought it might be fun to, um, to give you this nice formula to think about and also substitute 11 fourths for z. Because why not? Now, in this case, and if we say, let's say that, um, we can actually, as I said before, say uh, z does equal uh, 11 fourths. And then we're getting that uh, the gamma of 11 fourths equals, and I'm just dividing each side by the gamma of 1 minus z, so I'll just remember to do that, but um, it's pi minus the sine of, and z is 11 fourths, as we said, so it's the sine of 11 pi over 4 times, and we said we'd divide this, uh, divide this, excuse me, so it's, uh, t times the gamma of negative 7 fourths, because that's basically 1 minus 11 fourths. And so we can get somewhat of a better grasp of the numbers involved here. If you think about it, we're getting pi in the numerator. And what is the sine of 11 pi over 4? Well, if you actually consider the unit circle, uh, 11 pi over 4, so we go around once, that'd be 8 pi over 4 radians. And then we keep going for 3 pi over 4 radians. So that's a, a certain amount more, and we end up in the second quadrant, where our y component is equal to root 2 over 2, or 1 over root 2, equivalently. So in this case, I'm going to actually write 1 over root 2. Normally I say root 2 over 2, but it makes it easier to say 1 over root 2 here. And then the, the gamma, we can just keep that as before, we're taking the gamma of negative 7 fourths. And so furthermore, if we're dividing by 1 over root 2, that's the equivalent of multiplying by root 2. So now this is very interesting. It's pi root 2 over the gamma of negative 7 fourths. And you may already know that I am no fan of using decimal approximations, but I will if I have to, which actually is rather often the case when we're applying irrational numbers, whether you like that mathematical system or not. In particular, I, I ended up having to look up some values of the uh, gamma function. So gamma of negative 7 fourths turns out to be something like 2.76236945, and it's irrational, I'm fairly sure. And so that's going to be the denominator, and the numerator we have pi root 2. And all of this approximates to about 1.608359. And so getting back to our original problem, we were finding the fourth, uh, the quarter derivative, basically, of x squared. So it's 2 over 
this number, because that's basically the the gamma at 11 fourths. So I'm going to say pi root 2 over the gamma of negative 7 fourths times x to the 7 fourths. So this is this, this new function that we're getting, and it turns out to be a very good approximation for the quarter derivative of x squared. I, I honestly think this is all interesting, and, and this is going somewhere, so please do stay with me. The next thing we're going to do, just out of curiosity, is we're going to study the three quarters derivative of the same function. Believe me, this is going somewhere. This isn't all just useless calculations. Although some, some might argue that uh, calculations can, can sometimes be fun. But even so, the 3 quarters derivative of x squared, let's apply that same formula and we basically get 2 factorial over the gamma of, and it's this in this case, it's 2 minus 3 fourths plus 1, right? So the gamma of 2, let's just do this calculation real quick. It's gamma of negative 5 fourths times the square root of 2 over, and we're actually dividing by pi, and this is x to the 5 fourths, so it's like saying the fourth, uh, the fourth root of x to the 5th is about 0.3247979. And it's that quantity times the fourth root of x cubed. And so I've shown you a lot of these, these calculations and the uh, development of these functions. And so I'm going to actually show you on screen the graphs of these functions, and we actually see the graph kind of merging or bending toward its first first derivative. So now I, I find that just truly interesting, truly compelling, and seeing them all graph together is really, really wonderful. And uh, I, I've gotten some of this information from Wikipedia, as I may have mentioned, and it's very, it's very well done there. The example they give is actually the function y equals x, and I'll show you a, uh, a printout of the graph which they provide. So now, once again, in this example, we see the actual function being the blue curve, f of x, and we know its derivative is a constant since it's linear, but it's quite profound because we see this purple curve being the half derivative. You, you can really almost imagine that that original curve merging toward its first derivative, and this is precisely what it's doing. It's the half derivative. It's it's halfway to its first derivative, and that is truly interesting. Thank you very much for watching. Hopefully I've given you, at the very least, a broader view of a derivative through this video. Uh, sometimes there is a lot more to mathematics than you might originally think, and I hope I've shown you how topics can be expanded in, uh, in a very interesting way. Uh, one day, I'll, again, I'll probably make a sequel to this video, too. It'll be more in-depth. might study complex numbers or the, uh, the relation to the Laplace transform, which I'm currently trying to wrap my head around, by the way. And so please subscribe if you hadn't, and thanks for watching.